about Fermi liquid theory and in introduction manner to Fermi uh, to meta bad metallic behavior. Um, so I was a little bit confused about what uh, I could um, emphasize in Fermi liquid theory. Of course, like it's one of the pillars of many body physics. Um, but I decided to talk about Shankar's RG, which is like a more modern perspective to what you probably have seen in like uh, your standard uh, many body course. Uh, so um, the central problem is uh, starting from the free Fermi gas, um, what are the effects of perturbations on, 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 that, uh, free, um, on that free system? And where you can get qualitatively distinct uh, behavior by adding those perturbations. So whether this phase is stable, like, um, or if you add perturbations, you get a gap phase. Uh, so we're gonna answer those types of questions. And if you get a gapless phase, what is the low energy theory of that? Um, so the approach will be used, uh, we will be using a uh, Wilsonian RG. So I'm gonna focus on this, um, this review by Shankar. Um, so, I mean, it's a very nice pedagogical review. So I highly recommend everyone to read it uh, if they get a chance. So, okay, so uh, let's get into business. So first let, let me just um, like quickly brush up on like what the main results of the free Fermi gas are. So by like first um, you by poly blocking, um, the ground state is an anti-symmetric combination uh, as later determinant of uh, plane waves that form a uh, Fermi surface uh, in momentum space. Um, the main characteristics of this state are that it is gapless and that there is uh, a relation between the volume of the Fermi surface and the, and the density of particles. Now, this gaplessness uh, basically determines all the interesting properties of the state. So you look at the heat capacity, the spin susceptibility, the charge susceptibility, all of those are related to the uh, density of states uh, at the Fermi level. And so the kind of the puzzle was uh, at first, like in helium three, you would observe these similar types of scalings, but with different numbers in them. So it seems like the state was qualitatively similar to a free Fermi gas, but with some further renormalizations of, of the parameters in theory. So, okay, now uh, this is gonna be in the spirit of the journal club, very pedagogical. So let me just start with um, the 1D case of how to treat these perturbations, uh, like interactions over the free Fermi gas and then build up to 2D uh, and, and so forth. So, okay, so fermions in 1D. Um, so, we're gonna treat this within um, the, the Feynman path integral approach. So here, just a quick brush up on that. So these these guys are uh, Grassmann fields that depend on omega and k, um, and you get this i omega dependence because this is a, a, a coherent state path integral. Then here uh, you have the linearized dispersion around the Fermi points. Um, that's the index i labeling the left and right Fermi points in one D. Um, you don't see a chemical potential, so it's that half filling. And well, basically this describes the free theory, uh, the, the, the low energy sector of the free theory. Uh, I should also emphasize this K is not just um, the Fermi momentum, it's not the momentum, but it's the momentum re re relative to the Fermi momentum, right? So um, this runs from minus lambda, which is some cutoff um that you impose in the theory to yeah so to from what from a region just below the fermi point to just above the fermi point all right so we're gonna um when, when we add perturbations we're gonna label them as relevant relevant marginal uh to see what their effect is on this um uh, like on, on this state and to do that, like we were gonna do the like, traditional uh, Wilson NRG procedure in which you integrate uh, some set of high energy modes from lambda over S from, yeah, the, from lambda over S to lambda where S is a number greater than one, positive and greater than one. Then uh, if you want the, 
uh, the, the free theory to be a fixed point. You rescale accordingly the momentum and frequency uh, and the fields such that when you reduce the cutoff, you still get the same theory. So, okay, this is the free, um, free field fixed point uh, in 1D of fermions with a Fermi surface. So uh, just a, a very important point to, to make here is that in contrast to like what you would do for the five floor theory, um, here, uh, low energy doesn't mean low momentum, right? So um, your cutoff, uh, yeah, it's, being, it's, it's not at momentum equals zero, but actually has some finite momentum. That's gonna be the, the crucial difference here. All right, so uh, like as a warm up to the warm up, uh, let's look at quadratic perturbations. Um, so this might seem trivial, but this will be generated uh, in under RG dynamically when you introduce like the four Fermi interaction. So it's like important to look at them. So, okay. You have okay, your standard quadratic term and then some chemical potential that has K and omega dependence in general. When you generate it dynamically, you can have that, that dependence. Um, so we're just going to consider analytic functions as perturbations. So all the functions that I add uh, are going to be like, are going to have a Taylor expansion that converges. And well, let's see, like, if you apply that to mu and perform the RG. This is still a Gaussian integral, it's still quadratic in the fields. You can integrate the modes and you find that the only, so the only relevant uh, perturbation is uh, the constant mu. Then you get marginal perturbations, this omega and K. This makes sense because these have like the same, um, basically the same dependence as the uh, original action. So these are marginal and everything beyond that is irrelevant. Uh, so in general, the, the, there's an important point to be made here. Um, this is similar again to like when you have like a gapless, sorry, um, a massless uh, five for theory where the mass is dynamically generated. So you have to fine tune the initial mass for your theory to keep to be kept at criticality. So the same kind of business will happen here where you have to fine tune the potential to keep the density fixed. Um, but that's fine, it's just one parameter. So, okay, now, now let's jump into like the four Fermi term. So let me briefly explain the notation here. Uh, you have an integral over all the, all the momenta, so momenta one, two, three, four. Um, this one, two, three, four label the the, the the momenta and the frequency uh, the integrals go uh, onto uh, like up to the cutoff like the that, that same range that I showed before like from minus lambda to lambda and then you have a flavor index that labels whether you're in the right or the left or the left Fermi point then um, this of this is of course more uh, it's harder to integrate because uh, well, you don't have a quadratic action no more uh, so you have to work perturbatively, perturbatively um, doing like a cluster expansion of this. What you find at tree level is that the coupling is marginal. Uh, and, but, but the only component that is marginal is when it's a constant. So I can tailor expand this and all the higher order terms that, that are proportional to K, omega, or like higher powers of that are gonna be irrelevant. And the only uh, marginal coupling, coupling is the constant term. And okay, it's marginal, so I can forget about this dependencies. So the K, omega, one, two, three, four dependencies can be uh, like removed right out the outset but you still have the flavor dependencies. So what happens with those? Uh, you can further show that these are the only ones that survive. So um, scattering from fermions that start at two Fermi points and then and the two Fermi points. So something like uh, two fermions that start on the left Fermi point and go to a right Fermi point, um, those would be zero. Uh, the way to see that is that you have, for example, 
um, U-L-L-R-R. Though these two guys would be L's. So you could uh, anti-commute them. That would give you a minus sign, then change variables. And you would get a term that's equal to itself, but with a minus sign, so it will be zero. So this, this would be the only couplings that remain uh, at low energy. Uh, there's a caveat, of course. Uh, like it doesn't always, like just to reiterate this point, it doesn't always cancel if you have some K dependence because then by changing the variables, you don't recover the same action. So you can't conclude that it's zero. So that's gonna be a little important later. Um, okay. So, okay, let's go to one loop order. So that, that was all the results at three level. Uh, again, you can, uh, well, you generate this tadpole uh, graphs at loop order. Um, and I have to uh, also note something here. Th these are not um, like, I don't know what you consider traditional Feynman graphs, but these, these, these have a specific range in which you are integrating for the momenta. So here you're not integrating the momenta from zero to a cutoff, but you're integrating momenta on the thin shell where you're eliminating modes. So that, that, yeah, that, that's something important. And from those graphs, you can um, determine what the beta functions uh, are for uh, different couplings. So for the tadpole graph, you find the, this beta function. And again, to tune the density, you have to fine tune the bare uh, potential, the, the bare chemical potential, so as to cancel that the, this term and uh, you know, um, keep it uh, fixed as you perform the RG. Now, um, just, uh, I mean, uh, you may ask yourself, what is this T that I'm putting here? Uh, if you've not seen it before, that would be log of the cutoff. So yeah, just that's the name for that. Okay, now the interesting part is what happens to the coupling, uh, the four fermion coupling. So here, okay, you have, again, momenta go from right, left to left, right. Um, the tree level, we all already know it's zero. Uh, and this is already the, we already know that the, mom the momentum dependency of the, um, of the cutoff, of the, um, sorry, the momentum dependency of the coupling is gonna be uh, irrelevant. So this is just the running of the constant uh, term in the Taylor expansion. So you have, okay, one, two, going to three, four. And these different diagrams uh, may be familiar to you from quantum field theory. This is the TES and U channel. But here they usually call, they're usually called like zero sound zero sound prime and BCS. Um, you'll see why that is um, in a moment. And okay, let's see what these guys give. So uh, I realized after the fact that all my slides already give, like if you look at them, you already know what's going to happen. So, but let, let's still uh, go through this. So the, mar the, the, the three level, um, is marginal, so it, it, that, that goes to zero. The zero sound diagram is gonna go to zero for the following reason. You have two propagators um, and both have omega and k. Uh, so you have something like one over um, i omega k, um, i omega minus e k, but you're integrating over omega. Uh, from minus infinity to infinity. So, uh, because both poles are on the same side of the complex of the complex plane, you can close the uh, like the path around the the, the real axis um, on the other side of the complex plane, and this diagram will go to zero when you integrate over omega. That's something that will happen again uh, in two E. So uh, I don't know. Is is that? Yeah, no, I'll I'll leave room for questions in a moment. But okay, this this guy cancels. If you calculate the other two diagrams, this will be scattering from right to left um, here, right to left, and left to right. 
So you have a moment, momentum trans, transfer of pi. So that flips the sign of the um, of the of the um, energy here, and that um, moves the pole to the other side. So you can't close the the path from the other side. You always have uh, one pole inside your path in the complex plane when you integrate over omega. So this gives a, a finite answer, and by similar reasons, this also gives a finite answer. So. If you were to only consider this diagram, you would have that this, that U is relevant. And this would be a, the beta function. And if you only consider this BCS diagram, you would have that uh, the coupling is irrelevant. But by some coincidence, both of these cancel to give you a marginal coupling at one loop. So that, that there's an important point here as well. Uh, if you mean field and your ansatz is already assuming like uh, something like a CDW ground state, then because this guy is uh, relevant, you will find that the, the like that it's uh, like it's a valid solution to a mean field equation, and you will overestimate uh, how like, like let me back up a little bit. You would estimate that at infinitesimal uh, strength of interactions, you'll get that CDW within mean field because this, this coupling is relevant. If you assumed, um, for example, a BCS instability for a negative coupling, then your mean field will over, overestimate that. And yeah, but, but the, in the complete picture that takes into account both possibilities, uh, both cancel and you get just a marginal coupling. Okay. So, um, can, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, your previous slide, you're talking about this poles on on the same side of the plane thing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, if if the if I if I could instead consider the same problem except the fermions were not relativistic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then only the only the BCS diagram would be non-zero because you know, if you look at the BCS diagram, there are no like particle whole pairs created from the vacuum, right? It's just uh, you have a you have a right guy going in and a left guy going in, and they bounce off each other and go out. Mm -hmm. right? But the the other ones, like the the second diagram, you're like you have two guys going in, but then you like pop a particle whole pair out of the vacuum, right, or something. And uh, if the okay, fermions so were non, huh? yeah, yeah. So you're saying that uh, I get suppression in the first diagram. But then not on the second one, so I would have like the ECS instability. Well, yeah, I'm trying to. I'm, I I can understand. I understand why uh, you this the, the this this thing about like the two poles, whatever, being on one side of the complex plane or something mm -hmm. is kind of like uh, kind of formal. But uh, I I understand. I would understand why such a result would happen if in like a non-relativistic case where you don't, you can't produce any particles, right? Because the difference between the BCS diagram and the other ones is like the other ones are producing particles out of the vacuum or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I, I'm wondering if there's like an intuitive oh, way yeah. to understand why, why, uh, why the, is, if is, is there's like a more physical way to rephrase the st st sentence two poles on the same side of the plane. Uh, okay, the, uh, I think the, 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 there's one thing Maybe that I should uh, point out <laughs> all the like the you're reading the diagrams from left to right, right? Uh, so, well, it know, doesn't really matter. I, I'm reading. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I, mean, I know it doesn't matter. It's just like just for clarity. Like the one that's creating mm -hmm. particle hole would be VCS. So this would be the one that you're referring to. Um, that well, so so if I, if I if I look at VCS going from the bottom to the top, yeah, right, then. I just have two particles coming in and they bounce off each other and then they bounce off each other again, right? They would get annihilated at this vertex and then they'll be uh, like created at the, at the other vertex, right? Uh, sure, I, I'm just saying like, if you, if you think about like two classical balls scattering off of each other, you would write down the diagram. The, the BCS diagram would be the second order contribution to their scattering. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe I, I don't quite understand the question. Is it like, uh, 
this shouldn't happen when you have relativistic fermions? Uh, or I don't know. Maybe, maybe we can. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, maybe we can talk about it later. But uh, okay, I, okay. I feel like I have like eighty percent of an intuitive way to understand this, but I, I I don't really. Yeah. Anyway, maybe we talk about it later. Okay. Okay. This will come up again um, when I go to two D. Um, but I I don't know. Maybe we can discuss it then. Uh, although it's gonna it's gonna happen a little bit different way. Okay, no. Oh yeah, and I, are, are actually, this is actually yeah, sorry, sorry, actually th this is gonna happen. Okay, no. Maybe when we get to to the we can discuss about it more. Maybe it's more gonna well, be more clear there. But before you go to two D, are you gonna say why the fact that this is marginal is not an accident? Uh yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's okay. maybe okay. the next slide for sure. Okay. <laughs> because like you cannot like do the like maybe at higher order you get some instability, right? Uh, but this is 1D, the exact uh, solution for the model is known actually by Yang and Yang in 76. And like the, the story is that actually the word ident I, there's a word identity that uh, keeps this beta function from uh, being having a finite value. So it's gonna be zero uh, to all orders in perturbation theory. So um, there is a phase transition in the, in the, in the model but it's not uh, on the constant coupling uh, channel. It's on the unclap channel that I neglected uh, a couple of slides ago. And the story is, is very interesting. You have a line of fixed points. Uh, so in the exact model, you have a line of fixed points. Uh, in this region, you have that the unclap scattering is irrelevant. Then it becomes marginal at the, um, at the critical point and then becomes relevant. So your intuition that, okay, if I have infinitely strong uh, nearest neighbor repulsion should give a CDW, uh, like is correct. It happens at a finite coupling. And yeah, that, that's more or less the complete story, but it comes more from the uh, exact solution that from this one loop uh, RG level analysis. All right. So 2D. Um, Okay, that's the, again, oh, wait, wait, the, wait, the this sorry. The, this yeah, yeah. this unclap thing is only for a, for a, a very specific filling, right? Like half filling, right? If you just have some generic uh, filling, then there will be no. Yeah, no yeah. Sorry. Yeah, this is this is that half filling. This is that half filling. That's true. I yeah. This is that half filling. Okay. Now, uh, for for fermions into E, now you have okay similar action. But now you integrate over, over the angles. Like uh, to me, it was kind of weird the first time I saw this uh, because like you don't have the volume element here, the k that you would expect. Like I don't know, some k to happen there. But uh, what's going on is that little k is the deviation from kf. So actually, the, the, there's two terms, and here the dominant term is the one that has kf. And KF was absorbed into the normalization of the Grassmann variables. So yeah, that, that's where the measure went, uh, if you're wondering about it. But otherwise it's the same thing. Omega K integrated uh, um, between like the two cutoffs. And then now the angle labels the different points in the Fermi surface. And you have an extra dependence on uh, that data. All right, uh, so most of the things, uh, that I talked about before, uh, hold to the two-dimensional case, uh, on the two-dimensional case. Uh, it's just that now you have an infinite number of flavors, one for each theta. But the, the, there's a, an important thing that happens also, which is uh, this kinematic constraint on the form fermion term. So, okay, this uh, measure again uh, has in it encoded the firm, the momentum and energy conservation. All right. So, in general, for like if you if you didn't have a cutoff in the theory, you could have like k1, k2, uh, and k3 constrained k4, right? So you have three uh, free vectors on the plane, and then one that's constrained by momentum conservation. But uh, how the theory works, like momentum can only run in within the, 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 the cutoff. So for this theory, you only have 
two free momenta and the other two are constrained because you need also a condition that the momentum has the, the momentum has to be on the Fermi surface. So here there, there's like a quick depiction of that. You have K1 and K2. This is the total momentum. You have some K3 that also in the Fermi surface. So that constrains K4 to be on the Fermi, on the Fermi surface uh, because of the extra constraint from the measure. And this is a nice construction to like kind of see that, uh, that uh, like, yeah, all of your um, momenta have to be on the Fermi surface. So you can run again the, um, the RG for this. There's a, a slight complication on, the, on this because um, now when you integrate one of the momenta, you get a, a, like a theta function that will not scale, um, like doesn't scale accordingly. Uh, you can look, not factor it the S in the same way as you could in 1D. So there's like more of a complicated story. Um, you can have like uh, some, like the, the, there's techniques to handle that, but the sh like long story short is that there's only three uh, channels that survive when you um, run the RG for this. So there's three marginal couplings uh, at one loop, uh, sorry, at three level, at three level. So there's the channel where um, three is equal to one, where three is equal to two. So these two are equal under exchange. That would be kind of this situation where you have here, that you have here that three is equal to two and one is equal to four. Um, you have the exchange, the, exchange, the exchange of that. So exchange like three and four and you get the first case. And you have uh, a more interesting, like an interesting uh, possibility, which is uh, one is equal to minus two. So I will get to that uh, in a couple of slides. This is gonna lead to the superconducting instability. Um, and to be like picturing this is basically, this is one, two would be diametrically opposed. And then you don't have this kinematic constraint of being within these little shells, but actually the Second pair of momenta, K4 and K3, can also run uh, all along the, like any angle. But like, I'll get that in due time. First, let's focus on one loop uh, running of F. So, okay, we found F was marginal. Um, well, I told you F was marginal, we didn't calculate it. Yeah, but yeah, F is marginal. So the, the first contribution would be like, like possible contribution would be from the zero sound diagram. But again, um, so let me back up a, a, little, a little more. Um, here uh, for, for F, one is equal to three. So in this picture, you would get, okay, change three for four, this is for case two. So you have one, three, and two, and two, four, okay? So if this is equal to this, the first diagram doesn't have any momentum exchange. You just have one moment that's being integrated over. So you have K and K and omega and omega. So you have the same situation where the propagator has poles on the same side and this diagram is identically zero. All right. And okay, now I'm gonna give like some more or less heuristic of why the other diagrams don't contribute to any flow, such that F is marginal to one loop. Okay, so when you, like in, the, in these diagrams, you have a finite momentum exchange. You, get, you have like from, from one to four in this picture here would be the difference, the, the momentum difference would be this vector that goes from here to here, all right? So that vector is some number times Kf. That, so this is a large momentum exchange. And that is represented in this diagram by this vector here. So you can get a finite contribution to the omega integral if K is on one side of the Fermi surface, but K plus Q is on the other side. So if you look at this um, diagram, K plus Q is on, uh, it's outside the Fermi surface though. So there the energy is positive, but K is inside the Fermi surface. So at that point, E of K is negative. 
So the poles are on opposite sides of uh, the complex plane for omega. So I'll let that sink in for a moment. Um, so when you perform that integral, you eventually get something that's one over one over lambda. But the, then the k integral will give you something that's the omega. You're integrating from like some some momentum here to a, a momentum like that's slightly below from like you're integrating over the like thick shell outside. You're integrating the large momenta like near the cutoff. So that that k integral will give you a d lambda. And then there's an additional constraint on the angle. It can only run in this like small region one that I'm highlighting here. And the contribution from that integral is gonna be d lambda over kf, which would be like, it's like, it's hard to kind of see with my big pointer, but it's gonna be like the region where the two Fermi surfaces, like the, the two cutoffs intersect, the two thick lines intersect uh, divided by kf, which would be a radius here. So it's like the, you know, the, um, the, um, the arc length defined by that. Uh, you can come with that, you can find theta and then that's um, the lambda over kf. So these guys, uh, and you can have this, you have the same constraint for the VCS diagram. So at one loop, these guys are quadratic in d lambda. And then that means that you cannot express this as, as like a, as a simple derivative. And in the end, you don't have a finite beta function for this. So to one loop, uh, f is also marginal. So maybe I'll leave room for questions now. So, so is the is this this thing about the th two poles being on the same side of the plane? Is this can I say that this is the same thing as like uh, conservation of particle number, where I define particles as living outside of KF and poles as living inside KF? Mm, I think that might be what's going on. Like, like you you're, you're saying that uh, this diagram is only non-zero if I have like uh, one of these one of these arrows ending up inside. KF and one of them living up, ending up outside. I, th I think it's, it's like if you read these diagrams, the, the it's like number of particles has to be conserved or something. Yeah, I I don't I don't yeah I I haven't thought physically about like what this integration means. Um, like why it would be zero for this particular diagram? See, like I I think you can it, I think. I think you yeah. can argue by like, yeah, I think you can argue by like taking particles is living outside the Fermi surface, holes is living inside. And you know, you can like flip arrows on these diagrams, but and exchange particles and holes. And uh, yeah, every vertex has to have two arrows going in, two arrows going out. I think this argument. Yeah. That, anyway, so, that, sorry, that I'm just thinking, thinking out loud. No, 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 but I, I think what you're saying makes sense. Um, there's another way to think about this though, that I forgot to mention. This is kind of, uh, if you've done the calculation of like um, the density density response function on the free Fermi gas, uh, there, like you have different limits depending on whether you uh, send omega and Q to zero. And here would be like the Q goes to zero limit where you get uh, that the response function would go, like one of the two limits is zero and the other one is not. This would be a limit in which the, the response function goes to zero. Um, where Q goes to zero first. So that, that's another way of thinking about this. Um, all right, so F is marginal to one loop. So now what happens to V? So V is not gonna be marginal. There's gonna be three items that cancel and one that doesn't. Uh, these two cancel for the same uh, kinematic constraint reasons. You can you have finite uh, momentum transfers Q and Q prime that can lead to particles uh, having energy above and below the Fermi level. So the propagators don't cancel. But for the last one, there's a nice uh, thing that happens. You have K and minus K as the, as the vectors that you're integrating over. 
those are for sure on the same shell, on the same RG shell that you're like the shell of, that you're integrated uh, integrating in in RG. So they are both in the same shell, but uh, because uh, so th these guys had uh, zero energy, they live on this Fermi surface. This omega has to be minus omega. So the poles are gonna be for sure on opposite sides of the of the, of the complex plane. So um, the, there's an important fact here also, and it's that part of this is guaranteed because E of K is equal to my E of minus K, um, which means like there's some important role of time reversal symmetry here that allows you to make this conclusion. And well, you calculate the diagram and you get this flow for the function B. So remember like at this point, um, previously we had like just a single constant that had like some possible values because of you have uh, two flavors uh, in one D, but here you have an infinite number of flavors. So really what you're looking at is at the flow of an entire function as you go to the Fermi surface. Now um, you can, you can do the following, which is pretty nice. You can decompose this into Fourier modes. Uh, that will decouple this uh, convolution. And you'll get a flow for each of the Fourier modes. And OK, if you, had, if you started with a positive coupling, so a repulsive coupling, that will flow to 0, to a fixed point as 0. So it will be marginally relevant. But if you started with a negative coupling, that will run off to infinity, signaling the VCS instability. And that will be a marginally relevant uh, coupling. So with this framework, you can also see uh, that you get this, in, this instability uh, at one loop. And that's kind of why this is called the BCS diagram. All right. So, so far we have at one loop that F is marginal and that V uh, has this uh, interesting flow. So in principle, um, like <clears throat> you can ask the same question, like will this hold to hi like higher, to, to higher order? Well, one thing is clear, like even like going to further order cannot like undo the fact that V is no longer marginal. So that we have guaranteed for now. For V, for F, you can have like that at higher order, um, you get um, some other correction that makes it relevant or irrelevant. But um, there's an argument that I'm not gonna make here because I wanna talk eventually about bad metals that this theory can be seen as a large N theory where the, the large N is the number of patches in the Fermi surface. So the number of flavors is one angle in the like each angle in the Fermi surface. So you have just bubble diagrams repeating themselves uh, to all orders and then this uh, result would would hold. Uh, I'm very, I'm being very schematic here, but that like you can argue like from the point of view large end of this as a large end theory that this result will hold to uh, further orders in perturbation theory. All right, so that is kind of the RG justification for having this F. Um, uh, which if you have seen before uh, some, something about Fermi equal theory, you can recognize as the lambda wef function. Um, so, okay, this is gonna be a little more traditional. So what, what can you do with, uh, with that F? Um, well, what Landau did without like knowing RG or anything, he argued about um, how the low energy uh, theory of the interacting Fermi fluid would be, um, we have this form where you, <clears throat> where, 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 well, this is an expansion uh, on kind of a free Fermi theory in which the energy itself depends on the occupation number of the Fermi surface. Um, so if you work through the thermodynamics of this, you will find the same Fermi occupation for each momenta. But now E of P would be the sum of all these terms. This is self like this 
uh, is actually a self-consistent relation for N of P. And using that, at uh, low temperatures, you can calculate uh, different quantities. So the puzzle of like, how come that this looks similar to a free Fermi theory, but with some renormalizations is resolved by uh, solving those self-consistent equations and finding that you have basically the similar values for all of the quantities that you found in the free Fermi gas, but with uh, these F functions uh, appearing uh, here. As uh, like S and A refer to the symmetric and anti-symmetric F functions. So in all of what I did, I was using spinless fermions. Um, if you added a spin label to the system, to, 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 a, to a whole formalism, you would get uh, two F functions, one that's symmetric on the exchange and one that's anti-symmetric. That is kind of uh, evident from the fact that like, a um, couple of slides ago, I showed you that there was three cases that survived at uh, three level. One of them was the exchange of the other that would correspond to the anti-symmetric F when you include spin. And yeah, so uh, one note here, the M <coughs> renormalization is kind of special. Uh, it can be linked to a lambda web function, uh, but only in a translationally invariant system. So if you have a lattice, um, M cannot longer be exp uh, expressed in terms of, of F, but there's still an M, uh, like people still parameterize this with an M star. Um, and how you use this functions in practice is, um, okay, you first fit them to a few experimental parameters that you measure. And with that, you can then use them for further experimental measurements. So similar to what you would do um, like in normal renormalization. So it's, they, they are kind of like fudge parameters, if you wish. Although you can calculate them in Hartree-Fock theory, for example. Okay, there, there's also like uh, an important like self-consistency condition on this theory. Um, for you to have uh, long-lived quasi-particles, uh, you can calculate the scattering rate. Uh, this is like a famous calculation uh, by uh, Rikosov and uh, Kalatnikov, where you calculate the scattering rate of a quasi-particle going into a particle hole pair and another quasi-particle. And this is the famous uh, scattering rate that goes as T squared and as E squared. And basically, uh, if you like, if, if you generate a scattering rate that decays. Um, faster than this, then your quasi-particles are not going to be long-lived. So if you had like another scattering channel, so as with all scattering, like the, the most important one would be like the bottleneck, right? So if you have another scattering channel that doesn't, that falls faster with T, that, sorry, that falls, falls slower with T, uh, then that will dominate and your quasi-particles are not going to be long-lived. So this is kind of the condition for you to have long length quasi-particles. Now, okay. Um, this is getting us uh, into like transport theory territory. But before that, I wanna say something uh, else. Uh, some data of this calculation that probably is brushed up on. Um, you need to modify a little bit what I showed you out the land of expansion to cut to this calculation. So here, if you calculated this, the matrix element from two to two scattering, you would find that the only momenta that survive are um, like one, two going to one, two or the exchange of that. So you wouldn't have any momentum transferred from this Hamiltonian if you treat this as a Hamiltonian. Uh, so quasi-particles cannot scatter. So what you do is you add like some finite uh, Q dependence on this. So it'd be P sigma, P prime, sigma prime of Q uh, with Q being a small momentum transfer. That way you're like generalizing a little bit uh, on Landau theory itself, but then you're able to calculate these scattering processes with, um, yeah, with the condition that that Q is small, uh, which for 3D, it means that uh, the, so 
this is one, two going to three, four, the angle that these two planes make are is small, is equivalent to a condition that the that Q is small. And so um that you're close to a Fermi liquid regime when you do this calculation, but not really on the Fermi surface. So th that's like a kind of subtlety in the calculation. And that's buried here in this W, uh, this constant that multiplies the scalings. Okay, so um, on transport, um, well, as you know, um, when you have free, like the free Fermi gas, uh, you can describe the transport in that system by Druda theory. So, Wait, so sorry, can I ask can I, before you move on? Can I ask? Uh, yeah. well, uh, let let me try to think. So, can I can I understand this statement uh, as saying that the the scattering the things that cause scattering the interactions that cause scattering are all irrelevant, right? Yes. Okay. I think yeah yeah. Well. Okay. It's it's. Like, can I get this by dimensional analysis, but I know that, or, or can I understand the scattering rate in terms of wait, wait, the fact um, that it's irrelevant or something? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, this is, let me think. Um, is that true? Because if you add a Q dependence to F, then that Q dependence is gonna be irrelevant when you do ARV. So I think you're right, but there's also an element of like, the phase, like the phase space argument. Well, I think that's very into like, okay. I I haven't thought of that in, in that respect, but I, I like intuitively like zero order answer because the Q dependence in F is irrelevant under RG, I would think you're right. Uh, but I think there might be some other subtlety with like how the phase space uh, also enters into that argument. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if there's, no, I, I think you're right. Like the, 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 the thing that would go wrong is if an irrelevant perturbation could uh, generate a scattering rate that will destroy the quasi-particles, but I think that's not, that, that, that doesn't happen. So I, I think you're correct. It, this is generated by, by, by relevant operators. Okay. okay. Uh, so, okay, transport, through a, th through a theory. Um, so this is, uh, what you've all seen from solid state one. Uh, just an important point to make here uh, when, is that uh, when you plug in the decay rate, like the um, transport time, so the, the, the time that appears in, in Druda theory is the transport time, not really the quasi-particle decay time. So from the rate that I just showed you, you could, um, you know, uh, calculate a time by just taking the inverse and try to plug it in on, on sigma, but uh, that's technically incorrect because the the limiting uh, the like the, the the actual time that appears is uh, is modified by vertex correction. So let me elaborate on that. So the the conductivity uh, from this field theory perspective would be calculated as the current current correlation function. The three level calculation would be just including um, you know, uh, the time in which the quasi particles decay, but you have to include vertex corrections. And that is related um, yeah, to like the standard calculation by these uh, like forward scattering term that you include when you calculate the mean free path in which particles uh, which have like for like momentum that have like angles close to, how to say this? Maybe it's easier to say in the converse. If you have uh, particles that are scattering perpendicular to a field, those will not contribute to a, to a momentum, to a momentum relaxation. So those don't contribute to resistivity. So only particles that are uh, moving like perpendicular, parallel to a field are the ones that contribute to the resistivity. So that's why you, like that, that's why it's technically incorrect to add um, the quasi-particle decay here instead of the transport time, which is weighted by this extra factor. Um, and here, this, this W is, um, is the, uh, the scattering cross-section. 
So with that, you can create the immune-free path. But uh, even though you have that subtlety of having to just consider certain types of processes instead of just all the processing which particles, fuzzy particles decay, uh, even in that with that subtlety, you have a scaling that's T squared as well. So for electron-electron scattering. And then another subtlety on top of that is that for a translation invariant system, you cannot get a finite resistivity um, by uh, just doing electron-electron scattering in a translation invariant system. And this, the reason for that is that momentum is overall conserved. So you don't have any mechanism that will uh, dissipate momentum. So generally when people talk about T squared, they're implicitly talking about unclap scattering. Uh, which requires a large Fermi surface. So I don't know if you can see, but there's, this is a reference to like a paper by Dimitri Maslov, um, which talks about this um, in length and it's a pretty nice paper, but yeah. So you need like an extra condition that you need to observe this T squared resistivity that people talk about in Fermi liquids is to have a large Fermi surface in a, Non like in a system that breaks tra translational in, in translational invariance, <clears throat> and actually this is like uh, very hard to observe in real materials. So most materials have uh, a scattering rate dominated by electron phonon scattering or electron impurity scattering. So this is actually something that you are like not able to see in most cases. I think there is a clean example of seeing this in graphene, but uh, I can. Uh, put the reference in the in the Slack channel uh, later. So I, I have a I have a I have a silly question. Um, yeah. The so but but here the the current if I think in terms of all these you know uh, direct fermions this picture well Darji right the current the current is independent of momentum right the current the current is the velocity times you know Fermi velocity times psi dagger times psi right. So when you're, when, you're, when you're talking about momentum conservation implying no, uh, no, so, um, no finite resistance. So, so the, the, the current operator ha, has like, it does have a momentum dependence. Like if you calculate the diagrams, that's like the, you put like a, like a momentum vertex on the like. The, but but the like the, the, the but the current operator itself doesn't have any. It, it's it's not like you know, uh, if it was a if you're calculating with a non-relativistic system or something, current would be like psi dagger partial psi or something, right? But there's no there's no momentum. It's just it's velocity, not momentum. I'm saying. Right? Mm. Okay. So yeah. Uh... Like, like normally we don't distinguish the velocity and the momentum are just uh, related by M or something, right? And not, yeah, not yeah, 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 but, then but, there, but here it's question, not. Yeah, yeah, there's a question of like, when you couple minimally to a gauge field, then you get like momentum is different from the velocity, but, and, I, and that's not included in the, is that included in the current operator? Uh, well, so, yeah. so the, the current the current is just psi dagger psi, right? Well, sum, sum of theta, psi dagger theta, psi theta, right? Uh, so, uh, no, not really, right? You, you have to uh, consider like the Lagrangian couple minimally to a gauge field and then take the derivative of the gate, like of that Lagrangian right. with respect to a gauge field and that will give you the current. And I think there's two contributions right. from that. One's the, the paramagnetic and the diamagnetic contribution to that. No, but, right? but, the, but, the, but if I, that, that, that would be true if I was, I guess that's true microscopically, but if I look at the IR theory that you've been talking about or that Shankar was talking about with all these, when you when you linearize, and you just look at the low energy stuff, the linearization about the Fermi surface, right? Then in the, in the IR, the gauge field just couples as, as uh, psi dagger A psi, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So there's no momentum there, right? So I'm, I'm. Isn't, I mean, isn't, isn't it the case? So like, if I'm thinking Boltzmann transport, um, there's a velocity in there, right? Which, mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, the, and, yeah. The, uh -huh. And 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 the key fact, like when you have um, a lattice, when you break translational symmetry, that velocity will undergo like oscillations, block oscillations. So, mm -hmm. I I think that's what helps you get to zero, um, like zero current. Am am I wrong? Mm -hmm. Like w without. Um, Wait. So. Oh, hold on. Yeah. So what, what, maybe I lost track of the big picture part of the question. So the so question the, is. The, my, my, my point, my point was that if you if you compute the current operator in the IR theory, right, it, it yeah. only depends. There's no like, there's no momentum appearing there. Right? Uh, in the, in the IR theory, it's just Fermi velocity at angle theta, psi dagger theta, psi theta, right? Some okay. theta. So yeah, and uh, okay, okay. So, and then yeah, continue. Sorry. Okay, and then, and then I'm and then I'm trying to. Uh, equate that with the statement that the momentum momentum conservation implies that there's no resistive resistivity because mm -hmm. uh, there's no momentum, momentum relaxation. Uh, there's right, no momentum yeah. relaxation. Yeah. But the current is not dependent on the momentum, right? The current is dependent on the velocity. Okay. Let me Any, anyway. I, maybe I yeah, just, yeah. I should let just let think me think that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that there's like a, a subtle difference between them, and I have to think more carefully about that. Let me okay. think about that more. Um, but yeah, I don't know the top of my head uh, how that affects this picture. Uh, yeah. Okay. So how much time do I? Okay, I ran out of time. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> My fault. Okay. Um, okay. It's, so it's okay if you go a little over. Okay. I'm. I'm just gonna be. So I left all the bad metal stuff outside, but let me just um, take like leave you with one of the like some of the main points. So you have uh, these theories of resistivity that like like drew a theory. Uh, okay. First, there, there, there's different units for resistivity depending on the dimension, right? So these are like, uh, if you calculate like with the natural units of resistivity in which you have their bore radius appearing uh, here, this is like the normal, like, real, like quote unquote normal natural scales for resistivity. Um, but the main point here is that you have different values for different dimensions. Like the, 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 this has different dimension depending on whether you're in 3D or, or 2D. You can calculate that within Druda theory uh, and get and get this, these values. And then, wait, why, before, why is this the natural resistivity scale? I mean, if you had only units that don't involve uh, relativity, for example, so you don't have like C, and you only have the electron mass, H, E, uh, you know, things that what, what about, what about dominate. Q? What about okay. KF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that'll be like if you already uh, like assumed like the uh, like you like if you already knew about Fermi liquid theory, like you would say mm -hmm. okay KF, and you have like drew a theory which involves KF. Um, oh, okay. but I mean like a priori with just like dimensional analysis, this is kind of like something that you would expect. And I mean, I am this is just displaying like the units on mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Um, and actually, in well, let, let me jump a little bit higher. So, um, so you have the, the, these these values for the for for the, for the resistivity in through the theory, and the point is, uh, you have an extra constraint for the consistency of the theory if you uh, if if you take into account the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So there's some bound. On the regime of validity of this theory, if you take into account Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, so for Boltzmann theory, you consider generally like a distribution, a distribution function that depends on x and p. So you need to have those uh, satisfy the uncertainty relation, and that happens if the um, if the mean free path is larger than the uh, the, the Broglie wavelength of the fermions. 
uh, if you further uh, constrain this to be valid within Le uh, Landau Fermi liquid theory, you have uh, the uncertainty momentum has to be small um, on the order of kT for the like the normal like Fermi distribution. Uh, so that imposes a further constraint in which this has to be even like yeah has to be even larger. There's also the famous MIR limit that actually just uh, tells you like you don't have interband transitions where L, the mean free path is much larger than the, than the, um, than the interatomic spacing. And that is like how people basically uh, say something is a bad metal. If, if the resistivity that you measure um, he gives you a mean free path that is larger than where the theory is expected to be valid, then you don't have a quasi-particle picture that can describe that resistivity. So that happens in the cuprates. And let me like probably make the final point here. Like we don't even understand why the resistivity increases with temperature. Like that will be like, the, the picture you have is you have these quasi-particles scattering as you increase the temperature, you get more scattering of those quasi-particles. But if you don't have quasi-particles, why even this thing is increasing? Like that, even that is not understood. So I don't know, I find that amazing. It's a really interesting topic. Uh, I was gonna go ahead and like further like classify these states uh, from like what, how, like what little we know, like, but I mean, I'm happy to entertain questions and yeah. <laughs> thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of like speaking the, in the journal club. Yeah, thank you. Uh for giving your talk. Um, I saw something uh, maybe about the SYK model as you page through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay. So the, the, um, I'll talk a little bit about that. So <clears throat> there's kind of two, uh, broadly two, in, two classes of bad metallic regimes. The ones that go all the way to zero temperature and the wild, the ones that are unstable at zero temperature. So in <clears throat> here, for example, uh, this this rubidium um, Fuller and thingy here, if you apply a magnetic field, you would observe the magnetic like the the linear resistivity go further and further down in temperature. So you would say, okay, this bad metal regime maybe extends from really high temperatures to even zero temperature. And maybe it's controlled by some quantum critical point or something like that. But then there's other types of materials like strontium ruthenate oxide, one, uh, two, one, four, where if you go below some temperature, um, the system becomes a fermiliquid. So a bad metallic regime crosses over to a fermiliquid and they, it has like nice scalings that are what you would expect uh, from thermoliquid theory. So that there's broadly those two like uh, possibilities. And the SYK belongs to a second one. Uh, it is a bad metal regime in the, it has a bad metal regime at high temperatures, but at low temperatures it is, uh, it, it has some instability toward, not instability, sorry. It crosses over to a thermoliquid. Um, yeah, that's the Jones work in this PRX. And then these are all to other types of things that show t linear resistivity or like, um, you know, a scattering rate that violates the Fermi liquid bound, but then are unstable at uh, low energy, uh, low energy. And, and the kind of the, the point for SYK is that you need an infinite number of like tuning parameters for to stabilize the SYK at zero temperature. So yeah, they call this like IR incomplete phases of matter because of that. Yeah, cool. then thank the, like, you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for your question. That, uh, that tees up, we'll, we'll hear about the, more about the SYK model um, on January 8th. So that's a nice teaser. Yeah, looking forward to that. Uh, cool, any other questions?
uh, maybe let's. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Maybe I can just since I I've also read read Shankar's paper and I had to do some RG stuff and Jeremy Lipids. Maybe I can make a complaint and then you can I can see what you say. So my one complaint I have with the way that Shankar does this RG is that you do this uh, rescaling towards the Fermi surface, right? Yes. Uh, so, but if, if you do that, it like totally screws up your ability to like compute uh, real space correlation functions and stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, it, it, <laughs> when, when you do this crazy scaling towards the Fermi surface, it's completely non-local and real space mm -hmm. and it just is a, a complete disaster, right? So yeah, I, I yeah. feel like it's it's a lot conceptually simpler to not do this rescaling process, right? Yeah. And just and just compare couplings, just you know, make couplings dimensionless using the cutoff, right? And uh, you know, you inter integrate out a shell or something, and then you get a new cutoff, and then you look at dimensionless couplings compared with that with that new cutoff, and blah blah blah. Uh, and yeah. you get the same RG flow and stuff, but you don't have to do this rescaling and i think the rescaling is kind of unnatural from uh yeah I, like I, no, I no, no yeah. I, I agree the like the the kind of like it's it's conceptually simple like i guess if you this like the the review itself is very pedagogical and i found this to be like uh like like a nice way to explain it and I would say that like this is only valid for translation invariant system. So either way, you're not calculating like real space correlators. So you run out. Well, but I mean, one one thing that you would want. I mean, we know that in Fermi liquids, when you compute correlation functions, they have they oscillate at the scale uh, k Fermi, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, you mean like the, the free oscillations when you have like an impurity? Yeah, uh, yeah. Or just if if you compute like the the expectation yeah, yeah, value yeah. C, c dagger of x c of zero right where c is the electron yeah. operator then that oscillates at the wave vector uh that that that'll be look like cosine of k fermi times x right that mm -hmm. correlation function and that that, to that property gets totally destroyed if you do this re if you work in this do this kind of rescaling you have to use all these crazy weird variables i think it's very unnatural wait but um I maybe it I, I I am maybe a little bit confused. Like, don't you use like the like the typical thing where you approximate the integrals um, by only having finite spectral weight on the Fermi surface when you have calculation? Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, so that will be preserved here, right? Because you're sending the cutoff to zero. So the only thing that matters is the things at the Fermi surface. Mm. Oh, no, uh, I don't think you're sending the cutoff to zero. I, I think you're you're always I think you're always interested in link scales much longer than the cutoff, right? Uh, long, yeah, yeah. Than so when you cutoff. when you're yeah. doing the RG integration, uh, you're mm -hmm. looking at how the things run, right? But I I think in the end, like you're interested in taking the cutoff to zero, right? Or I... Well, I mean, I, I never want to take the cutoff. I never want to take the cutoff to below the inverse link scale of the physics that I'm interested in, right? Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Like if I if I take the cutoff to zero, then I can't create. I, I then. Yeah. I, no, I, I mean, I I have to, I can only be interested in real space correlation functions at a scale maybe. bigger than the inverse cutoff, right? But even if you work in the cutoff going to zero, like. As long as you have the Fermi surface, the calculation proceeds in the same way, right? Because you will only consider states in the on the Fermi surface to calculate that correlation function. Mm, I, I I feel like you still I still I feel like you still need to integrate over a uh, to to get the correct power law and stuff. You still need to integrate over uh, all momenta a, 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 a thickness of momentum, right? Hmm. That's true. Like, like more broadly, I think that as a calculational tool, I don't think it's really good. Uh, like, yeah, the whole approach. Yeah. yeah, it's just very like conceptually clear. Uh, like, like the this, this localization to the uh, BCS and forward scandling channels, like, also is kind of subtle, right? Because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 
you never get the exact angles. The angles are only approximate to within a. Yeah, angle. and there's a, like yeah. another problem that that doesn't yeah. like you, you're only using analytic couplings, and the Coulomb interaction is not analytic. So. Oh, but that but, well, but the Coulomb. I mean, it, it probably gets screened to something analytic, mm -hmm. is the assumption. But. Yeah. So no, I, I actually like I I saw like this talk by Ch by Shankar uh, earlier this year. And he was saying that oh, cool. the, the, there's a subtle problem. Like in the RG, it's not very clear how you can separate those when you're doing the integration. Like that 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 happens like in like uh, like when you already have the f function and you do Landau ceiling theory and you can like uh, like separate the like the two terms uh, like one that's only in the zero momentum channel and then the short way like the short range interactions uh, spread on the mm -hmm. other moment like angular momentum. That 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 is true for Fermi liquid theory, but it's not clear how to like how that comes about from the RG. Mm -hmm. Apparently, yeah. Well, oh yeah. Also, do you know how to do like Shankar's uh, stuff in a magnetic field? <laughs> no, but that, that's a really interesting question. Though I. In a magnetic field. Why, why, why I ask is because Wait, we when know, you do like magnetic, a strong magnetic field, like meaning you have like Landau levels, so like weak magnetic field, and you have like uh, no weak magnetic field. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like weak, weak, weak <laughs> magnetic, yeah. All right. Just, yeah. just because when you know, the Shankar's approach only allows the the fermions are all like one dimensional, right? And so when you turn on it, well, when you turn on a magnetic field, magnetic field, you get quantum oscillations, right? So describing things in terms of one dimensional fermions is very unnatural. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because, because like the, 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 the number of, yeah, yeah, you, you wouldn't get like the same conservation for like the number of like, right, right. And you need patch in each pa patch. Right, yeah, so. Well, yeah, yeah how, with, with the magnetic, at least semi-classically, the magnetic field leads to transport between patches, right? Yeah. Like. Yeah. Exactly. So. So then the question right. is how how you do this RG? I guess. I, mean, I guess the mag the magnetic field is kind of like a drastic thing to add for these representations. Kind of changes the. Low energy spectrum. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, you can't you can't just minimally couple uh, you can't just minimally couple this this theory to a magnetic field as written. This has to be something else. Yeah, yeah. There, there's okay. <laughs> Maybe going a little bit on that. Uh, there's a very interesting, like, one way in which people generate non-Fermi liquids is by actually coupling to uh, gauge, like emerging gauge fields. Uh, right. So one example is like here that I didn't get to talk about the composite uh, fermion in the half field lambda level. You can calculate like uh, like the dynamic, like how the um, gauge field there. Uh, dynamically responds to um, like the fermions, you find that the scattering grade uh, doesn't uh, have this Fermi liquid scaling. That, that's a way in which people calculate. I mean, like, mm -hmm. tell me that things are non-Fermi liquids, but this is like a strong interacting like gauge field with, with fermions. A, a bit different, but just uh, like going on a tangent on that. All right. So, any more questions, or <laughs> should we call it a day? Um, yeah, I think uh, that was great. Uh, good intro. I will have to check out. I know Ethan, you had talked about Shankar's um, paper, like maybe three weeks ago or something, at a group meeting. So this is additional motivation. Oh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I, 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 I yeah, I, I, maybe I, I, I think Juan and I probably agree that it's like really useful to read, but then if you try to actually do stuff, yeah, <laughs> do yeah. like research <laughs> using the formalism, but you, ha you realize that there has to be more there that's actually going on. But, well, it's especially yeah. the, the uh, project that I might undertake next <laughs> would involve like the magnetic field. So, <laughs> oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Yeah. Um, 
All right, cool. So thank you. And we will reconvene next week. Uh, Dan will give us a talk on quantum Hall physics. Um, so maybe we'll hear about the uh, composite Fermi liquid then. All right, see you everyone, enjoy your